Okay, yeah, so um, you probably know me, and my name is Mark Ancliffe, um, and I'm going to teach this class in modern physics. So, first of all, we have to define what modern physics is, right? So, what is modern physics? So, the definition of modern, I looked it up in a dictionary. It means relating to the recent times or the present, right? So, in Korean, you say, Okay, so it kind of means now, but to, to use modern physics with this meaning of modern is a little bit misleading. Um, for example, I show you these pictures here. Do you know what this is? Yeah, a camera, right? And this is a telephone, right? Actually, when I was young, telephones still kind of looked like this. Um, but the point I want to make is you wouldn't describe these things as modern, right? This is not a modern camera, and it's not a modern telephone, right? These, both of these things were made in the 1930s. And if you look at the topics in a modern physics class, there were two main topics in modern physics. The first one is relativity. The second one is quantum mechanics. And in fact, these theories are just as old as these machines here, right? So to, to teach a modern physics class and to teach relativity and to teach quantum mechanics is at first, a, a little bit, um, it's a little bit of a strange use of the word modern, right? Because these theories are not modern. They're, they're nearly 100 years old. Okay. So the first thing I want to describe to you is why do we use, why do we call this modern physics? Okay? So it's, it's not modern in the sense that it's just been found out. Why do we call it modern physics? Okay. Um, so again, I want to use the analogy of the, the telephone and the camera. So in the 1930s, a telephone looked like this. If you go back to about 1990s, then you get telephones looking something like this. And then these days, you get telephones look something like this. Right? Um, similarly with cameras, this is the camera from the 1930s, about 1980s, and this is a modern camera. So one thing you can see is that although the technology has developed, the basic function has stayed the same. Right? Especially if you look at the camera, you know, you can see there's, although this one looks very different from that, there's a lot of similarity, right? The function uh, um, and the way it operates are more or less the same, right? We still use phones for calling people, although we can do lots of other things now. Um, whereas these technologies, when they were newly invented, were very different from what came before, right? So before you had telephones, you had to write somebody a letter, right? or go and see them directly. Um, before you had cameras, you had to paint a picture. And that's a completely different kind of technology. Right? Um, and the same thing is, is kind of true in modern physics, in that the relativity and quantum mechanics are very different from what came before. Um, so before people discovered relativity and quantum mechanics, which is sometime before 1900, there were many scientists who thought that physics was more or less sorted. Okay? They had the Newton's laws of motion and gravity. They had Maxwell's equations, which describe um, the electromagnetic phenomena, including light. And it looked like they nearly understood everything. Okay? But there were just a few little bits and pieces which didn't quite fit, which weren't quite right. Um, and two examples of these. The first one is some various experiments on the speed of light. And the answers you got were not consistent with the Newtonian theory. Okay? Um, and actually, this is going to be the first topic of this class. So starting on Thursday, we're going to look at these experiments on the speed of light in a lot of detail and to see how they're interesting. Um, a second thing which didn't really fit is the measurements of the light from hot bodies. If you heat something up, like a, something in a fire, you put some wood in a fire, then it starts to glow. Right? It starts to emit light. And that light has a very characteristic spectrum. You can look at the frequencies of the light emitted, and it forms um, a very universal distribution, which is known as the Planck distribution, um, if I plot it briefly. If you look at the light coming out of these hot bodies, and you plot how much light there is as a function of the frequency of the light, the frequency of the light is how much light there is, it forms a spectrum something like this. So you have a, a peak frequency which is the most commonly emitted 
frequency of light, and then you have a range on either side. Okay. And this is true whether you look at wood in a fire, or you look at um, the old style of light bulbs, or if you look at the sun. Okay. The, anything which is heated up, well, not quite anything, but many things when they're heated up form this characteristic light distribution. And this is something that classical physics, that is, Newtonian physics, um, Maxwell's laws and so on, could not explain. So that was another thing that they couldn't explain. But at the time, they didn't necessarily seem like two serious problems. But it turned out that these two things, the questions over the speed of light and this descriptions of these light spectra here, formed totally new parts of physics. And in particular, these experiments on the speed of light led to the theory of relativity, which is going to be the first topic of this class, um, and in order to explain these light spectra here, the only way you can do it is using quantum mechanics. Okay. So, therefore, around this time, around the 1920s, well, somewhere between 1900 and 1930, you had this revolution in the way that the world was perceived. It's no longer Newton's laws or the classical laws of electromagnetism, but we have these completely new theories, the theory of relativity, the theory of quantum mechanics. Okay? And because these are, are new theories, we therefore refer to these things as modern physics to distinguish them from what came before. Okay? Right. And if, as I said with the camera and the phone, although the phone has developed through time and the camera has developed through time, the basic technology is, this, is similar, right? The same is true in physics. Of course, quantum mechanics, relativity, um, and the things which they lead to have been developed over the last 80 years or so, but the, the core is still there. Okay. So this is um, some research I found, some data I found. What are American graduate students studying? Okay. In 2000, this is the most recent data I could find. Um, so there are various different fields, condensed matter physics, atomic and molecular physics, and so on, particle physics, nuclear physics. And if you look at these fields, you can identify what fields require a knowledge of quantum mechanics. These I've colored in blue here. What fields require a knowledge of relativity. These I've colored in green. And then what fields require both. The color is in red. Okay. Now, obviously, this isn't 100% true, because I don't know exactly what research everybody is doing. But as a general rule, you, there's no way you can do condensed matter physics without quantum mechanics. You may need relativity as well, depending upon what you're studying. Anyway. So you can see that virtually everything, this other thing, we just don't know what it is. So that, that may also be quantum mechanical or, and so on. But you see that virtually everything is using quantum mechanics and relativity. So that's another way in which we can, we can call these subjects modern physics. Okay. Although they were discovered a long time ago, they still form the, the core of physics research today. Okay, so that, that was um, my attempt to motivate the subject and to explain why do we call this modern physics. Now, in the next part of the presentation, I'm going to briefly describe how we're going to do the class. Okay. So what topics are going to be um, and how I'm going to introduce them. So I've divided the topics we're going to see in this class into four major sections. The first one is special relativity. The second one is general relativity. General relativity is a theory of gravity which is consistent with special relativity. So in special relativity, there is no gravity. And then if you want to add the gravity, you get the theory of general relativity. Okay? Um, so those are the first two. Then quantum mechanics and then particle physics. So I've divided them into these four major headings. This is a lot of content, and there's no way you can cover all of this thoroughly in one class. Okay? For example, in, in, in the third year, there are two semesters worth of only quantum mechanics. Right? Yang, yang jo yakak il, yang jo yakak yi. Okay? So, so I can't possibly do all this in this class. So therefore, my aim is mostly just to give you the basic concept. Okay? I'm not going to teach you the full theory and the full practice of 
quantum mechanics, for example, but I just teach you the, what the basic ideas are. So I'll do that for general relativity, quantum mechanics, and particle physics. I'll spend about two weeks on each, and I'll try to give you a, a broad, vague understanding of what the subject is. Special relativity, though, I'm going to concentrate on. Special relativity is, is nice for a modern physics course because you can cover it in not too long time. Okay? So I, if you look here, I'm going to spend about six weeks on special relativity. And I think within that six weeks, this is all special relativity here. I think within that six weeks, I can give you a pretty good understanding of special relativity in detail, okay? which would be impossible for a subject like quantum mechanics. So therefore, I've decided that until the midterm exam, we're going to focus on the theory of special relativity. And this, I want you to have a, a deep understanding of by the end of the class. And then after the midterm exam, we'll have a, a series of introductions to general relativity, quantum mechanics, particle physics. 